in this video, which is going to be our last video on inheritance and composition, we're going to talk a little bit about those um, public, private, and protected. We're going to mention protected a little bit this time, or the ways that we can do inheritance. We'll also talk about composition and then end with the discussion of object-oriented design in general. Okay, so we've already had in our discussion of classes the idea of private. So if an object or if a class has a something, a member data or a function that's private, then it can only be accessed from within that class definition, okay? As opposed to public, which can be accessed from outside. So we use public functions to get to private data is the way it typically goes, okay? So there's this third category of protected. Protected really comes in when you're dealing with inheritance, okay? So we're gonna go through an example of this. So we have here um, on the screen, the space class we're calling base, real, real original, okay? It has, in the public area, it has a public function that doesn't do anything except that public function in the base class. It has a protected function called protected function. Again, just says what it is. And then a private function. So these are all in the base class. So we're gonna create, in this instance, a, a class called derived. And, but instead of public, which we've done before, we're going to do protected. So what protected does for us here in this derived class, when we create this new function to access the base functions. So uh, the function that we declared as public in the base class is accessible. No problem at all. That would be like if it were public. What's different is that we have this protected function. So because we have declared it as protected, and because the function was protected up here, we're able to run that protected function. So what protected does basically is it protects functions. They're not public, so not everybody could run them, but they can be ran by derived members of that class as long as that's allowed. Okay, so that's that's basically what that comes down to. Okay. So of course the public, the private, you can't get to at all. So here's another instance of this, okay, uh, where we're we're doing this derived type. Sorry, we're in the end main now, okay. And it's just a, again showing what we can and can't access, okay. I thought that was going a different way. I forgot my own example, okay. So basically, what would change here if we were to have this um, inheritance here as private? Nothing could be seen. If we were to have it as public, then the public function could be seen, but not the protected, okay? And of course, not the private any times. So that's kind of how that works. Protected gives us the ability to give some rights uh, to children of, of a class or derived classes or subclasses um, that we don't give just to everybody, okay? That's where it comes in. So the next thing we're going to talk about in this chapter is going to be this idea of composition. So as we've said before, inheritance is an is a relationship. So we would say that um, a square is a rectangle. A employee is a person. So what we do with composition instead is a has a relationship. And composition is also called aggregation. And the idea here is basically that you're going to have an instance of one class be member data for another class. So it can be used to build up things, okay? You see this oftentimes, a car has an engine, a car has wheels, things like that. In this simple example, and there's a different example in the book, but this one um, is one I think that's a little more straightforward. We have a class address, okay? It's a class representing a street address. And it has four strings here. It has a street, city, state, zip code. Its public constructor looks like this. And it's sending these along as constant references, um, which you can do or not do. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So we've got those all there. And this uses the alternate format that I'm not a super big fan of. But when we're doing composition, I think it works a little better. 
And basically what this is saying is after the colon. So since um, we're in the constructor, we're just setting street. So the street here refers to the street up there and we're sending it or assigning to it the value street that comes from there. Same for city, same for state, same for zip code. And then the function itself has no body because we're kind of calling that, okay? And this looks like when we call the constructor in a derived class, this colon does, but that's what we're doing here. And then we have this display address function that just spits out that information that we just did. So now if we go to derive, um, I'm sorry, a different class, a person class, we're not deriving anything. It's a person class and the person class is going to have a string, that in there, it's going to have a string for their name. And then it's going to have an instance of the address class that we just defined above, okay, called address. Big A refers to the class that we just defined. Little A refers to what it's called. So now when we run the constructor here, okay, for the name, again, we're using the constants we don't want them to change, and we're, we're using references here, passing by reference, the address called address. We're then using the same thing we did before, setting the name to name, setting the address to address. And this is simpler than trying to do it the other way. We could always just say name is equal to n instead of name, but you can't by default use the equal sign to make a copy of an instance of a class. You can define that, but you don't do it by default. Okay. So that's why we're doing it that way. And then we have our display info function. It's a constant function because we're not changing the person. And we're going to start uh, with the name, and then we're going to just display the address. So pretty basic. And then in uh, our uh, function down here, okay, we have to create first the address. There's the address. We're then creating a person where we send the name, and we send that address object. And then we just run the display info. So mm -hmm. not too much going on there, but it does give you an idea of how composition works. So I think that inheritance comes, it's used more than composition, but I mean, it's not unusual to use composition. Once you have your objects, you can place them in other classes if you need to, for sure. So the last thing we're gonna talk about, let me switch over here to a different screen. OK, um, just to talk about this idea of how we, we're designing our programs. So thus far, we've been talking only about structured programming, where we, we find the data, we find the relationships between it, um, and, and we, we do functions, things like that. But now that we're talking about classes, we've moved into what's called object-oriented design. So an object-oriented design, the whole point is identifying classes and objects and operations on those objects. And that's how we're gonna develop things from now on, okay? So there are three basic principles of object-oriented design. These are important, um, very important that you understand these. The first two we've seen, the, the next we'll see later. The first is the idea of encapsulation, and that really is the main point behind object-oriented design. When we create a class, we're able to encapsulate or or put together data and operations on that data. And we use that to model some entity in the real world, typically like a person or a car or a boat or whatever. So that's encapsulation. As part of that, we often get information hiding in that you can put things as private data and then you can control the operations and how they're able to affect that data. So that's a very important concept. The other one we just talked about is inheritance, and that's the ability to create new objects from existing objects, so, so new classes from existing classes. And we just talked about that uh, in the last video and in this video somewhat. 
And and then finally, the the last one is polymorphism, and that's the ability to use the same expression or or the same uh, way of interacting with objects um, to denote different operations. So it's something like the plus sign. Uh, when we use it with integers, it does one thing. If we have the plus between two classes, we can do something else. So polymorphism will come up in the next section. So those are the three basic principles. And then we're going to end, the chapter ends, and, and I've copied this example pretty much from the book directly. It's giving us some hints on how we can identify from our problem statement, classes, objects, and operations. I've said before, and I've tried to give some examples, that in a programming class, you get pre-digested programs. It tells you exactly what to do. The real world, you don't get that. The real world, you get a big mess of words, and you have to figure out what it is you're trying to do. So you will never get in the real world, unless you're maybe a beginner programmer at a company, you'll never get, oh, create an object that does this. Here's No one's going to give you a UML diagram. You got to create your own. So this is giving us some hints on that. So it says, suppose we want to write a program, calculate some prints, the volume and the surface area of a cylinder. So we have it here, write a program to input the dimensions of a cylinder and calculate and print the surface area and the volume. So what, what they've done here, so the, the trick here is we're going to take all of the nouns. We put them in bold here. So program, dimensions, cylinder, surface area, and volume. Those are all nouns. So we have to look at those and figure out which of those would most likely be a class. Well, the dimensions relate to something else, uh, the program we're writing, so we don't. that's not going to be an object. And the surface area and the volume are all attributes or things that we can determine about something else. So it's pretty clear that cylinder would be the object that we're interested in. So they're going to call that cylinder type. So from this, we can create as many cylinders as we want with different dimensions. So the other things that we're talking about here, dimension, surface area, and volume, then are characteristics of the cylinder. Okay, and those can't really be classes, as I just said. So once we identify the class, we have to next figure out these three pieces of information. The first thing is the operations that an object of the class can perform. Okay, so if you're a cylinder, what can you do? Okay, you also determine operations that can be performed on an object of that class type. Okay, and the, the last thing, which I think to me would be the first thing, it's the information that object of that class must maintain. So I like to, to phrase it in a more personal way. What must an instance of that object know about itself or maintain about itself. So if we have a cylinder, what do we have to know about that cylinder? What does it have to know so we can do what we need to do? So that's where it comes in. So if it's a person class, what does the person need to remember? Uh, that person object need to remember in terms of, of our system, whether it's name, ID number, whatever it is, okay? So when we look at the verbs that we identified up above, uh, that's going to give some possible operations that they can perform on itself. So we have write, input, calculate, and print. Okay, so of those, write relates to the program we don't care about, but input, calculate, and print do make sense. So we would have an operation, the input operation uh, to input the dimensions is going to be in the constructor, or it could be through a set of mutator functions where you can set the different values if that's allowed in your program. Calculate would be used. That will be a function we can develop inside the class that will allow the volume and the surface area to be calculated. And then print is, it's pretty common in most classes to develop um, a print function that, that prints out the dimensions of the cylinder in some, some way, okay? So that's the idea there of object-oriented design. As we move on to data structures, we're going to get um, more experience with this. Uh, and, and as you move in your programming career in general, you'll get a better feel for this. So if you're writing a program, and and it's often the case when I'm writing a program, I'll 
decide, oh, I need to know this about this object and I don't have it. So you then have to go back, add it to the class, and then you can start using it. It's the same way with variables. I mean, we like to put our variables to declare them all at the beginning of the program uh, if we can. If you need a new one, you go back and add it and you modify. And that's kind of the process here with object-oriented design. Uh, object-oriented design is the, the basis of, of many programming languages. Uh, we saw it in Python. It's not a huge deal in Python, but it is a, a possibility that you can do. Um, in languages like Java and C Sharp, which are very much used in business today, in those languages, objects are kind of the base way we do things. So objects and understanding object-oriented design is an important skill, without a doubt. So that's it for inheritance and um, for composition. In the next chapter, we'll talk about other, in the next section, we'll talk about other ways that we can use these classes to solve problems.